Hey man, Genesis chapter 10 and Yeah, we'll begin in verse 8. It says, And Cush begot Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, Even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, and Erech, and uh, Akid, and Kalnea, and the land of Shinar, out of that land went forth Asher, and builded Nineveh, and the city of Rehoboth, and Kela, and Resen, between Nineveh and Kela, and the same is a great city. Okay, we're going to uh, look at this man uh, whose name in the Bible is Nimrod and look at uh, who, who is that man and uh, the kingdom that he built, Babel, uh, later uh, became known as Babylon, Babylon or the kingdom of Babel. Uh, Babylon was, as you know, um, especially uh, later under the King Nebuchadnezzar was a great, uh, great city that had one of the, I think it actually had two of the seven wonders in it. It was the Hanging Gardens and what else do you remember? I think that there was two actually in the city of Babylon which... Uh, no other city can boast of that. Uh, but anyway, uh, it was a great city, uh, especially back in, in this era. Um, and Nimrod was the king over that city. It says, um, Nimrod, he began to be a mighty one in the earth. Now, remember we, we saw in Genesis 9... Um, not Genesis 9, I'm sorry, uh, Genesis 6, about these uh, giant men. Um, let's see. Verse 4, it says, There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the children of, uh, unto the children of daughters of men, and they bear children to them, the same became mighty men, and these were, which were of old, men of renown. They were mighty men. In other words, they did things uh, mighty, and, uh, you know, what they did was mighty works, whatever they those works were. Uh, this Nimrod, mighty one, before the Lord does not mean he was a good person, okay? Just like um, Obama is a mighty ruler in the United States before the Lord, okay? Because he's before the Lord. The Bible says that the earth is God's footstool, and so we're before him. Uh, and so Nimrod was a mighty hunter, before the Lord. Uh, it doesn't mean he was a good person because by no means was he a good person. We don't get that much history of him in the Word of God. Therefore, the history that we do have, we have to question it. Okay? It's not inspired. Therefore, there could be error in it. But just like history, you know, the history of Abraham Lincoln, you can get the, um, the writings about Abraham Lincoln and all the stories about Abraham Lincoln, just like the stories about Davy Crockett. Man, I loved that movie growing up. Davy, Davy Crockett, king of the wild frontier. Uh, you know, you can get the stories about these men. They were real men. You know, David Crockett did fight in the Alamo. 
uh, and people like that, but like stories will do, they're exaggerated, okay? And so we have to understand this. Anything in history, uh, books, is going to be exaggerated, either good or bad. It's just like the, the Kennedys. Uh, you know, today we look at the Kennedys as being great people. Uh, but people that know and remember those days, they weren't. You know, they were the Obama of that day. And uh, sadly, uh, there wasn't much crying when he was, you know, assassinated. Now, I'm saying there wasn't much, uh, and I don't want to be taken wrong. It was a horrible thing. It, you know, I, I'm not agreeing with it. But... Uh, it's not like it's put on today, you know, that they were great people. The same thing with Abraham Lincoln. None of us was alive back then, obviously. Uh, but as history does, it exaggerates either to the bad or to the good. Okay? The things we know about Adolf Hitler are bad. Therefore, they're exaggerated. Okay, I'm not saying he didn't kill millions of Jews. He did. That's facts, you know, prove that. Uh, but, um, you know, they, they are exaggerated. We have to understand that. Uh, so the, uh, the history of Nimrod, we do have history uh, all the way back to them days. And um, is history, but nonetheless, there is some truth in it. And so we have, to, we have to look at that and look at what Nimrod did when he built Babel. Uh, now, Babel, uh, Babel is, it has a couple meanings. One is the word that we derive from it, babblings or Babel. Uh, he's just babbling, uh, is, you know, a speech that can't be understood, okay? And we get that from what God does at Babel, in, ver in chapter 11 we'll get to there, but God confounds the languages, and that's known as Babel, okay? But another thing that that word uh, means, if you break it down in the Hebrew, is Bab and El. Uh, now, El is God. It means God. Uh, it's part of the word Elohim, which is the, the, um, the plural form of God. Uh, but El is God, and then Bab is gateway. And so Babel is the gateway to the God. Yes, that's, that's what they, when, when Nimrod said, you know, this Babel, he said, this is a gateway to the God. Now, what did they do at Babel? In chapter 11, we'll see, they built a tower to reach the heaven. Okay, they thought they could reach uh, God. And, um, so, uh, whatever um, the meaning, and there's a couple other uh, meanings that can derive from that. Uh, one of them is that it's translated actually in the Hebrew as rebel. Okay, Babel can mean rebel. Uh, thank you, Brother Joe. Uh, it can mean rebel. Uh, another possible breakage, and it depends on where you break the word up, uh, it can mean panther. And that's interesting, uh, because a panther is a black leopard. And the Antichrist is called a leopard. He can't change his spots, you know, and that kind of things. So that's interesting. Uh, but he builds this uh, city called Babel, okay? The Bible also calls him the Assyrian 
the Assyrian. Uh, let's go to Isaiah chapter 23. Isaiah chapter 23 and verse 13. It says, Behold, the land of the Chaldeans, these peop uh, this people was not till the Assyrian founded it for them that dwell in the wilderness. They set up the towers thereof, they raised up the palaces thereof, and he brought it to ruin. Okay. Um, one of the names of... Nimrod in the Bible is Assyrian. Um, let's see. And Assyria, uh, Assyrian is A S S I R I A N, I think. Um, Assyria is called the land of Nimrod. Okay. Um, and that's in Micah, Micah chapter five, verse five. Okay, it says, And this man shall be the peace when the Assyrian shall come into our land and when he shall tread in our palaces, then shall we raise a right against him seven shepherds and eight principal men. And they shall waste the land of Assyria with the sword and the land of Nimrod in the entrance thereof. Thus shall he deliver us from the Assyrian when he cometh into our land and when he treadeth within our border. Okay. Uh, and there's a lot more applications that we can draw from them verses. But what I want you to see is that Assyria is called the land of Nimrod. Um, and so the, these other lands that are mentioned here, uh, in Genesis, uh, chapter 10, verse 10, uh, the beginning of his kingdom was Babel and Erak, Erek, and Akkad and Kalnia, Kalnia in the land of Shinar. Okay, these Erech, Akkad, and Kalnia um, could be communities within Babel. Okay, it, it, Babel would be like saying Ellis County. Well, Ennis is part of Ellis County. Okay, and the Ellis County Sheriff Office uh, controls, you know, they patrol Ellis County. They're they're not just in one, you know, they're not just in Waxahachie. That's just where their base is, okay? And so it could be one of these situations where uh, these are like communities within Babel, uh, and they're like little cities, and Babel is the big, uh, the big city, you know? It's just like we consider ourselves in the DFW area, okay? We're not part of Dallas, but we consider ourselves part of it because of the quick commute um, to Dallas, and that's the big city uh, that we live close to, other than Waxahachie, if you want to call that big. <laughs> Actually, I do. You know, when, when we want to go, you know, on a day shopping, we'll go through 
uh, Waxahachie. Have you ever been downtown where they sell the old stuff, antique? Oh, man. I could spend all day in there. Uh, don't come out with nothing. <laughs> Everything's overpriced, but uh, <laughs> still fun. <laughs> yeah, I do, actually. We've never been. We've always talked about going, but you know we had two kids to take up there now we have three so we're like we'll wait till they go to college <laughs> fredericksburg is it nice down there oh huh well yeah mine isn't considered antique shopping mine is considered antique looking <laughs> exactly drooling i saw brother the one of the and i'm sorry i'll get back to this in just a minute but i saw on online they were selling a manual table saw oh it was beautiful it was built back in the early 1800s and it had just like a sewing machine it had the foot pedal and you'd get that thing going, then you'd shove your board through there, and I mean, it was it, it was beautiful. I said, man, that'd be nice to have. I probably wouldn't ever use it, but <laughs> it's like my manual drills up there, you know. I'll, I'll probably never use them unless, you know. Well, anyway, okay. Uh, so, Babel was a, a big city. Uh, it, it wasn't, you know, a small thing. It was big. Um, another thing I want to notice about Nimrod is when it says he was a mighty hunter, it doesn't necessarily just mean that he killed deer and that he killed, you know, the bird. He was a great dove, you know, shooter. Uh, this hunter implies that he searched out and conquered. And he was the first of many world leaders, we could say. Um, and something you want to notice about this is verse 11. Asher, when Nimrod went in and built Babel in the land of Shinar, Asher came out. And he went and lived somewhere else. And that's important to know because Asher is a descendant of Sham, not of Ham. Okay? And um, we'll come back to that point some other time. Uh, but just want to point that out because all the uh, other versions uh, say that Asher is, a, is one of the cities that he built up. Uh, it's not... Verse 22 says, The children of Shem, Elam, and Asher, and Arphax said, and Lud, and Aram. Um, and so Asher came out, and he actually built Nineveh and some of the other ones. Okay, I uh, want to move on to something else about Nimrod. He became known after his death. He became known due to his wife's uh, manipulation and controlling. He became known as the Sun God. Okay, S U N, Sun God. And they would worship the sun and all, all of that. He, one of his, a couple other names they goes by is Baal. And Moloch, okay, is Nimrod, Baal and Moloch. Uh, now, this is after he's dead. His wife was the um, propagator of this religion, okay? He really, he really didn't have much to do with the starting of the religion. He was, he was just the conqueror. Okay, he wasn't the philosopher and, you know, all of that, but his wife was. Huh? No. No, no, we'll, we'll get to uh, that. Uh, her name was uh, Semiramis, Semiramis, uh, and Ishtar, Ishtar. Um, 
Ishtar is I S H T A R. Okay. And one of the notable things about Ishtar is that after he's already dead and she comes up with, he's, you know, converted into the sun god, well, she gets pregnant. Okay. And he's been dead now. She gets pregnant. But guess what she tells the people of Babel? That he's the daddy. That it was a miraculous birth. And notice this, that her son is the promised seed. Her son is the promised seed. And that her son is actually the father reincarnated. Okay, so she has a son whose name is Tammuz. Okay, Tammuz is the son, but he's also the father. So she marries her son. Okay, uh, this weird family. Uh, Ishtar uh, gets deified into the moon goddess. Okay, so you have the sun god, the moon goddess. Her son gets deified as the, uh, the god of the underworld, who is resurrected every spring. Okay, now, this is all years you know, 2,500 years before Christ. This is a long time ago, okay? Um, but they knew something of the promised seed even back then. Uh, and it was orally passed down, the Bible says, uh, until Moses pinned it down and it became set as it were. Um, I don't know. Um, yeah, I, I don't know uh, why they were were saying that or what the deal was. I know the spring is the new life after winter, uh, but I don't know why. Well, no, it wasn't. Res he was resurrected in spring. In other words, spring was him. Yeah, the spring itself was him. Pretty much, yeah. Uh, and he became known as the god uh, of the underworld and was resurrected every uh, spring. Now, Ishtar, remember, she is uh, the, the goddess of the moon or the moon goddess, but she had another title. And that title is mentioned in Scripture. It's known as the Queen of Heaven. Okay, the Queen of Heaven. Uh, now, Brother Steve and them's not here. But there's actually a religion on earth, uh, and actually an Ennis, that teaches the Queen of Heaven. Anybody want to guess? The Catholic. Okay, the Catholic religion teaches that the Queen of Heaven is Mary. And they gave her that title. Okay, they also teach that she is the mother, not of Jesus, but the mother of God. That Jesus is the Father and the Son. Okay, um... Exactly. And that's, that's what you want to ask because it's not that we're against Catholic people. We're against the philosophy that Catholics have or the religion that they have. Okay? Uh, and so we don't believe that Mary is the mother of God. They say, this is, this, you know, I'm, I'm going to play the Catholic. Well, do you believe that Jesus is God? Who had Jesus? 
who was his mother. So he's she's the mother of God. Exactly. Okay, she is not the mother of God. She's the mother of the Son. She's the mother of the physical part of God the Son. She is the mother of the physical, not of God. When we say of God, she brought divinity into the world, and that is not true. God has always existed. Okay? Um, so, and there's a lot more, uh, if you want these, uh, resources to, to look this up and the history and all of that, uh, the book is called The Two Babylons by Alexander Hislop. And, uh, everything's well documented in there. I mean, it's, it's amazing uh, everything in that book. There's another book by, all I can remember is his last name. I have it actually, if you would like to read it. It's called The Mystery Babylon. And he goes into some things. He doesn't go into near as deep. The two Babylons is this thick and, you know, a good sized book. And it's all documents, so it's very boring reading, to be honest with you. It's boring. Uh, and unless you want to, you know, uh, read up on things like that, you probably don't want to uh, buy it. But this other one is Woodroff, 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 something like that, uh, is his last name, and it's called... Uh, Mystery Babylon. That sounds like it. <laughs> okay, let's look at the Queen of Heaven real quick. Jeremiah chapter 7. And this is interesting because whenever you ask... Uh, a Roman Catholic, and remember, I grew up in Mexico. Uh, yes, chapter 7. Um, whenever you ask them who the mother or who the queen of heaven is, they'll say Mary. And you ask them, do you know that the queen of heaven, once they've committed themselves. See, I'm not a good fisher uh, of fish but I'm great at setting hooks in humans. And you ask them who the mother or who is the queen of heaven, once they commit themselves to saying it's Mary, then you start drawing in. Do you know that Mary or the queen of heaven is mentioned in the Old Testament? And most of them will say no. And then you take them to this, this verse uh, in chapter 7, and let's start reading in verse 17. Yes, ma'am. Is it Babylon Mystery Religion? Yes, that's it. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Jeremiah chapter 7, and... Seventeen. Okay. That sounds good. It says, Seest thou not what they do in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem? The children gather wood, and the fathers kindle the fire, and the women knead their dough to make cakes to the queen of heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto other gods that they may provoke me to anger. So God gets provoked to anger when we do anything for the queen of heaven or other gods. Okay, now go over to chapter 44. Chapter 44, and uh, 
verse 15 through 19 says, Then all the men which knew that their wives had burned incense, chapter uh, 44, verse 15, and all the women that stood by a great multitude, even of all the people that dwelt in the land of Egypt, and Pathros answered Jeremiah, saying, As for the word that thou hast spoken unto us in the name of the Lord, we will not hearken unto thee. It's a sad day when you know that the prophet of God has spoken, yet you say, even though we know it's God, we're not going to listen. We're not going to do it. And this is the reason. It says, but we will certainly, in other words, but, remember what Brother Mike said, they're doing away with everything that the Lord said, and they're going to do something contrary to that. It says, we will certainly do whatsoever thing goeth forth out of our own mouth to burn incense unto the queen of heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto her as we have done, we and our fathers, our kings and our princes in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. For then, when they done that, when they did all this, for then had we plenty of victuals, uh, they had plenty of food, and were well and saw no evil. But since we left off to burn incense to the queen of heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto her, we have wanted all things and have been consumed by the sword and by the famine. And when we burned incense to the queen of heaven and poured out drink offerings unto her, did we make our cakes to worship her and pour out drink offerings unto her without our men? And it goes on and Jeremiah explains, the reason you don't have is because you did that years gone by and God's judgment is just now falling. And if you keep doing that, his judgment's just going to keep falling. You know, we, okay, for instance, my, my father, uh, you know, after he got saved, he didn't have, you know, very much of anything before he was saved. He was a multimillionaire. After he got saved, it seemed like he was a poor man. Then he got sick. Then he had a cancer. Then, you know, finally he died. And you ask the Lord, why is all this happening after he got saved? It's because of the things he sowed and uh, planting seeds before he was saved. They just came back to haunt him after. You know, and so it's not, you know, we get saved and then, you know, we're passing all these trials or we start trying to do right and then things start happening to us. It's not necessarily that we're trying to do something else. It's those things that we sowed in our past are finally catching up to us. And that's what uh, Jeremiah explains to them. Um, then notice what Jeremiah says in verse 25. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, saying, Ye and your wives have both spoken with your mouths and fulfilled with your hand, saying, We will surely perform our vows and we, uh, that we have vowed to burn incense to the queen of heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto her. Ye will surely accomplish your vows and surely perform your vows. Therefore hear ye the word of the Lord, all Judah, and uh, that that dwell in the land of Egypt, behold, I have sworn by my great name, saith the Lord, that my name shall no more be named in the mouth of any man in Judah in all the land of Egypt, saying, The Lord God liveth. Okay, and uh, you can read the rest of it and see what happened to them. Um, but what I'm getting at is. The people in the Old Testament, they 
fell in to worshiping these other gods. Uh, at one point, and you can read about it, they started offering their own children to Murdoch or um, Baal, uh, Moloch, Moloch, uh, Murdoch. Where did I get that from? I've heard it before. Uh, but they started offering their children to this god in fire. And it was called passing their children through fire. Uh, a horrible tradition. Yet what happened when the Roman Catholic Church came to power in 300 uh, something AD. Uh, they brought the, the traditions uh, of the heathen, and they say this in their encyclopedia. You can uh, look it up in the encyclopedia. It's actually under candles. Uh, you look it up, and, and it will say that they brought them things from pagan religions uh, and Christianized them. Uh, Ishtar uh, was Christianized to, and I hate to say, well, I don't hate to say this, but it was Christianized to Easter, okay? It's Easter, there's nothing Christian about Easter. There's something Christian about Resurrection Sunday, okay? Uh, we believe that Christ was resurrected, but what happens on Easter a lot of times is more associated with Easter religion where they're worshiping the spring god and, and all of that. Uh, so we want to... Uh, uh, make sure that we're doing things according to the Word of God and not to traditions of men. Okay? And that's something hard to do. And there's a lot of things that we do uh, that are traditions of men, and it's okay as long as they don't go contrary to the Word of God. Okay? Once they go contrary to the Word of God, then they become wrong. Uh, let's look at one more verse, Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20. Verse, well, verse 3, 4, and 5. It says, Thou shalt not, uh, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in earth beneath or that is the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them serve them for I the Lord thy God am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me and so uh, the Bible clearly says and in many other places that we are not supposed to have any graven image uh, of any kind that we worship okay and um, the Catholic counterpart is, well, you have pictures hanging up, and that's an image. Yeah, but when's the last time you bowed down to grandmother? When's the last time you bowed down to her and served her? Okay, we don't. But what do they do? Now, here it's not so much, at least in the Hispanic tradition it is even here, but down in Mexico and in other places, they'll actually take the statues out and carry them around with them uh, on special occasions and parade them around uh, for people to see. Like, just like, you know, when's the last time you've taken a photo around, parading it around? you know, serving it, then set it down at the table and get a plate of food for it and for you. We've never done that. But the Catholic tradition is where they serve their idols. 
It's not the same thing as having a pitcher. It's uh, a workmanship of something that you are worshiping. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Is there any questions before we dismiss? Okay. Um, verse number 12. Hey, Amen. Lord God, we sure do thank you, Lord. We pray that you'd bless us, Lord, and uh, pray that you'd encourage us, Lord, and uh, thank you for everything you've done. We pray that you'd uh, go with us as we go out of this place, Lord, into our homes, and we'll give you thanks in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.